Today I want to take selfishness to its logical limits. In the last lecture, I hope you got how robust selfish behavior is within a population of individual organisms. So that even though we might all do better if we all got along, selfish traits can spread even if it damages the species as a whole. Today I want to take that concept down to the molecular level. And I want to show you how genes can be favored by natural selection even if their only purpose is to spread themselves. So these are called selfish genetic elements. And the first class of these involves a phenomenon called meiotic drive. With meiotic drive, you get an unequal representation of each homologous chromosome in the gametes. Now, when we did these dihybrid crosses, Mendelian genetics, we calculated what the ratio of different genotypes would be because of independent assortment and all of this. Getting this ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, where there's complete dominance in a double hybrid cross, this assumes that there's equal representation of each homologous partner in the gametes, that all four of those combinations of alleles on different loci are fairly being represented in the gametes. But with meiotic drive, there's unequal representation of these chromosomes in the gametes. Let me start with a specific example. And this is often something we see where there's chromosomal sex determination. There are genes that are on the sex chromosome, so they're sex-linked. And they can benefit from distorting the sex ratio. The prime example of this is called the X killer which is found in the Egyptian mosquitoes, and it's located on the Y chromosome. So Egyptian mosquitoes have the XY se uh, sex determination system as we have in mammals. Now, another way we can get this kind of meiotic drive is in what are called male killers. And this is in uh, a number of parasitic species of wasps. And these are cytoplasmic elements that benefit by the production of daughters. And I'll go through these examples in turn. First is chromosomal sex determination. You'll recall we have the mother who has two X chromosomes, so her eggs always produce a gamete that has an X chromosome on it. The sperm of the dad, half of them are going to have the X chromosome and half are going to have the Y chromosome. So we get an expected sex ratio, equal numbers of XX, and XY offspring, so equal numbers of sons and daughters. Now, in the Egyptian mosquito, and this is one that's shown in amber, just as a pretty picture, we have the sex chromosomes forming a tetrad at meiosis. We'd have the same sort of thing happening in mammals. And this Y chromosome has this nasty ability to be able to destroy the X chromosome. So at the point in meiosis where the gametes are about to go off to be haploid, the Y chromosome destroys the X chromosome in the germ cell. And so only the Y-bearing gametes are viable. So this male mosquito can only have sons. He can never have daughters. Now, with this weird system, you have an X chromosome that can be destroyed by the Y chromosome. This has led to selection in the mosquito for suppressor genes that are located on the X chromosome that protect them against this killer Y behavior. So here we have an X chromosome. It has the suppressor's gene on it. So at this key phase here in meiosis, the X chromosomes are standing up to the Y chromosomes. They will not be broken. And so the X survives, and the individual now can produce equal numbers of X and Y gametes. And so we have the preservation of the X chromosome defending itself against this killer Y chromosome. Now, when I talk about cytoplasmic elements, I need to digress for a minute and talk a little bit more about what's inside individual cells. The bacterial cell have this one circular chromosome. And they have these little extra bits 
and they're called plasmids that have their own DNA. We haven't talked about those yet, but we will shortly. Otherwise, inside this, there's really not much going on in terms of what we want to talk about today. It's that main chromosome. We'll get back to the plasmid shortly. When we get to eukaryotic cells, we have our nucleus, and so all the chromosomes that we've been talking about with Mendelian genetics, including the XY chromosomes, they're all inside the nucleus. And this is true in the animal cell and in plant cells. These are both eukaryotic cells. But what defines a eukaryotic cell is there's a lot of other stuff going on in the cytoplasm besides just the nucleus. And in particular, what I want to focus on are the mitochondria. So these the blue things here in the animal cell, they're also in the plant cell. And there's a number of different mitochondria in each eukaryotic cell. Okay? And plants have another organelle called chloroplasts, and these are these green things here. So now, the thing that's important for us today is that mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA. And they're actually a lot like bacteria that live inside of our cells. So they reproduce separately inside our cells, and their DNA has virtually no interaction with the DNA in the nucleus. Okay? So they have their own agenda inside the cells. Now, the reason this is important for the topic today is that the mitochondria and chloroplasts only get transmitted from one generation to the next in the cytoplasm of the egg. So eggs are those big germ cells, right, whereas sperm are tiny. In the egg cells, you've got the mitochondria, but you don't have them in the sperm or the pollen. So here we have an adult cell in a female, and so we have the mitochondria in the adult cells, and likewise in an adult male cell. Here are the mitochondria, there are the nucleogenes there. When the gametes are formed, the mother's mitochondria is passed on in her eggs, but the dad's mitochondria is not passed on in his sperm. This is so small, there's no space for any mitochondria in there. So in the next generation, all of our mitochondria comes from our mother through the egg rather than through the sperm of our father. So this sets up a really weird potential conflict in that the mitochondria may decide that, you know, I'm only going to get passed on through daughters, through females, because they're going to eventually make the eggs, and I'll hitch a ride to the next generation through the eggs. Whereas if this family is investing too much in sons, uh, that's resources that could go to the females. Okay? So it would be more copies of me several generations down the line if there's mostly daughters. Because they're the ones that pass on the mitochondria. Now there's an actual example of this, extraordinarily enough. The ladybird, the little ladybugs, are carnivorous insects. They're great. They control household pests and plant pests. And it turns out that they occasionally have these really nasty, selfish mitochondria that kill the sons of a female. And so the developing larvae now are not going to develop into grown-up sons. Those developing larvae of this family end up as food for their sisters. And so this allows the selfish mitochondria, by killing its own host in the male is now providing a meal for its sisters over in, the, mito in the, the mitochondria that are in the female larva. So an extraordinary way to get more copies of your mitochondria in the next generation from the point of view of the mitochondria. No good from the point of view of the ladybirds, but a very selfish thing for the mitochondria to do. So these are fairly strange examples. The Egyptian mosquito, that was only discovered when people accidentally hybridized Egyptian mosquitoes with other species, and they found, whoa, in the absence of one of these suppressor genes, the hybrids were only producing sons. And the ladybirds is a pretty strange example, too. But they do exist, and the take-home lesson so far is that there are genetic elements out there in nature that do not always work in harmony.